Hi, everybody, and welcome to the kickoff to HCD's webinar series for 2021. Today, we are talking about norms, metrics, and media madness, uh, where we're going to be having a frank discussion on norms, metrics, neuroscience, and media testing. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview about how today is going to go, uh, how today is going to really process, um, and a little background on the topic before we launch into the discussion, as you can see with all the panelists that have joined us today. Um, quick introduction for today's webinar on a frank discussion on norms, metrics, neuroscience, and media testing. Uh, it will be, the discussion will be led by myself, Michelle Nigella, uh, PhD of Behavioral Neuroscience and VP of Research and Innovation at HCD Research. Um, this is also organized and run through our fearless leader, Glenn Kessler, who is president and CEO of HCD Research. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna be giving a brief introduction where we're gonna talk about uh, how this webinar is going to go, as well as just some housekeeping issues. Um, then we're going to talk about cons consumer and market research and how it's going now, how historical data and forecasting happen, facing a new normal. And then we're going to do some panel discussion with start that off with some introductions and then launch right in to a couple of questions um, around this topic. So please feel free to comment and ask questions via the chat function. You can also use the Q&A function if you want to ask questions anonymously. Feel free to reach out to us directly via email. You can also link with us on LinkedIn. Um, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, tweet with us if you have thoughts during the webinar that you would like to tweet. Please feel free to tweet with us. Um, and any of the other ways that you can go about uh, uh, communicating with us, we're, we're happy to hear from you. Um, without further ado, I'm going to start uh, with a short introduction about who we are at HCD that is hosting this. Um, we do a webinar series every year where we focus on issues in uh, market research uh, that concern all sorts of researchers that might be touching consumer products or market research. Um, HCD's research approach is grounded in a holistic understanding of the consumer experience. Uh, we use the most innovative and effective research tools as well as traditional tools to get a better understanding of how co consumers really interact with things. Our research can be done in person or online all around the globe. Um, our applied consumer neuroscience approach helps us get a deeper understanding of the human experience across all sorts of aspects of the consumer experience, which can include anything from exploration to validation in your research. So as we went in and started off last year, we actually did a webinar series on this where we talked about a new normal with what's happening with uh, COVID and the pandemic, um, that where you know people used to be going in person to sites, things changed quite a bit where everything was now being done at home. So it was establishing sort of a new normal of behavior. And the question really became, you know, how are people um, changing their behaviors and their thinking and their interests in relation to this new normal? You know, people are doing a lot more things via webinar. For example, here's one of our uh, gatherings that we had just with our internal team to get together and have a happy hour. Um, so people really found new ways to interact with one another, but also interact with products. So it wasn't that we couldn't just go into the store as often as we had or as freely as we had before and just want to touch everything and bring the whole family with us. It changed to a lot more of online shopping where your behaviors and your interaction with your brands and products changed quite a bit too. So this was, a, you know, for some people, a completely new way of doing things. For, for others, it was kind of a way that things were going anyway with more online shopping. So when we think about normative databases that typically help um, product developers or market researchers or marketing people really establish how to communicate with their consumers, they use normative databases to understand what um, the general public is really thinking right now and compare it to what, what they were thinking before. However, some problems do come up with normative databases, such as when there's changes in society or maybe changes in the environment, there could be errors and go, no go decisions. Um, and it's also a very fixed design. So there's a couple of issues that can come up there that we actually talked about in our webinar last year when all this was really hitting. Um, and we've seen these sort of issues before where we did research uh, on Super Bowl advertising over a number of years, 2008, 2009, and 2010. And when we compared those to normative scores on ad performance, um, we found that the norms were shifting. So an ad that may have performed well in 2008 
would not have performed as well in 2010. And it was really a reflection of the market collapse in 2008. And so understanding that things like that, a very you know, big economic event, could really drive the overall experience and ways people interact with brands is important to note. Because it means that when you're using a normative database, that it may not be as relevant if something happens and things happen all the time. So then the question becomes, what is the um, utility of a normative database? And then there's another piece of that as well. As um, other methodologies have really become more popular, this has really added to some of the confusion around normative databases and what's the best way to go about testing consumer interaction with products and communications. And so a lot of people have added neuro testing into this mix. Um, and then that's where we start seeing a lot more of the metrics kind of issue come in, where you had performance metrics before based on surveys, people have started adding in EEG or facial coding or some other sort of measures to start to tease apart um, what else is going on to try to say that you know even more about what's going on with the consumer. Um, but then a question becomes, uh, what are you really measuring when you do EEG? Uh, can it really predict the future? Um, is it representative of, is it generalizable? Is it representative of all consumers um, or just to the, the small number of people that were tested with the headset? Um, are they, are the suppliers using black box, box measures where you have no idea what the algorithms are or the, what the metrics mean? When they say something gets an eight out of 10, what is that eight out of 10 for? What does it mean? Um, so there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion there as well. So as we've headed into this sort of new norm um, and changing way of measuring consumer interaction with communications or whatever you know, marketing it might be, um, a lot of questions have really come up, especially in this case of norms, metrics, and then you add in neuroscience to that mix. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panel of speakers today that we've invited to speak with us. We have a really great panel, an interesting and diverse panel here. Um, we have uh, Vinod, um, and we have Anna, and Ray, and Chuck, um, a really interesting group of people that uh, all come from diverse backgrounds. Vinod, for example, is a professor at Temple University, PhD in neuroscience. Associate Professor in Marketing and Director for the Center of Applied Research and Decision Making at the Fox School of Business. Um, he is very heavily involved in uh, neuromarketing types of research, uh, very well published in many top leading journals um, and a leading um, and fellow at Ipsos, which is a leading market research company. Uh, we are also joined by Chuck Young. Uh, Chuck is CEO um, and founder of Emerita. Uh, which is an international advertising and brand research company. Um, and so he's won many awards uh, in his work in advertising research and has books uh, on this very topic that we're talking about, so making memories, which talks about advertising um, and consumer memory. Anna Wexler is a professor, assistant professor in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She has a PhD from MIT um, in uh, Anthropology, Science, Technology, and Society. Um, and she, her dissertation was around DIY brain stimulation. And she's won awards for her work. Um, she's done a lot of really interesting work around the issues of consumer neuroscience and ethics. Uh, and so we're really happy to have her join us as well. Ray Pettit uh, is Executive Director of the Masters of Science in Business Analytics Program uh, at the Rady School of Management, University of California in San Diego. Um, 22 years uh, in the business, he's worked across all sorts of uh, projects, um, but looking at, you know, decision making, uh, multivariate data analysis, um, he has books uh, and he's won awards <clears throat> for market research, um, and we're really happy to have this really interesting and diverse group join us to talk about some of these uh, topics. Um, and so uh, I would like to ask the group to join in in uh, giving a brief introduction about yourself. And um, I'm going to close out this uh, presentation um, so that we can just have our faces on the screen. Um, but if you could just give a really brief uh, your feeling about this topic, uh, we'll start with Vinod. If you could um, go ahead and just give a brief overview of your, your view of this topic before we launch into some of the questions. 
Uh, thanks, Michelle, and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this group. Really looking forward to some of the discussions today. Um, I guess I contribute more from the neuroscience methodologies and metrics uh, point of view. Um, like Michelle was saying, I've um, run a center at Temple called the Center for Applied Research and Decision Making, where we use a number of tools ranging from eye tracking to biometrics, uh, EEG and fMRI. Well, we did a pretty large project with Advertising Research Foundation uh, in 2014, uh, where uh, we tried to look at the relative contributions of each of these methodologies uh, in predicting success of advertisements in the marketplace. Uh, and the goal there was twofold. One is to quantify uh, what each of the methods bring to the table and to how well do they generalize to a measure outside of the laboratory. Uh, so I guess my own view is that um, the methods all serve a distinct complementary purpose and you really need to have a good idea of what is it that you're trying to answer uh, and then choose the methodology based on that rather than say, I have this cool methodology, so let me just go use it. And then looking at the numbers, try and make inferences on the data itself. So it should be the other way around uh, where the appropriate use of methodology is guided more by the research question and the objectives rather than um, the method itself. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it. Great. Chuck, let's go with you. Uh, I founded Ameritest uh, back at the, uh, in the old days of television before the internet arrived and changed everything. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I, I basically sell changes. Self <laughs> three changes. I sell self-report data, basically. The, uh, yeah, I, always, I always like to tell people that if I was a cardiologist, I would love it if the heart could tell me how it was feeling and what was going on. We only have one organ in the human body that can actually talk to us. It's called the human brain, that's in it, and it can tell us a lot about what's going on in the interior. That's why we write novels and read novels. And, uh, uh, you know, so on the subject of norms, uh, I, I'm also the inventor of the picture sort. I believe that you know, television was about vision, the internet, selling on the internet is really about the visuals. And so I invented a technique years ago called the picture sort, which allowed me at a very granular level to probe uh, the responses to people in a video very moment by moment after they've seen the video, not like you guys while they're watching the video. So it's very complimentary in that sense. And I actually measured on five different dimensions. So, you know, almost second by second. Uh, norms aren't going away. Norms explain about half of what I need to predict. And at the report card level, they actually, you know, that's what the industry lives by. And the basic reason we live by it is ab advertising is a competitive business. And norm is the cheapest, most efficient way of telling a brand team whether or not your advertising is better than the other guys. Advertising. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you really grow your brand by winning the fight for the consumer's mind. And so that's my attitude is that, uh, you know, we try to give our clients a competitive advantage by A, telling them whether or not an ad is going to sell something by comparing it, you know, to a norm and basically saying it's better than the other guys. And B, if it's not working, helping them to find the problem so they can figure out how to optimize it and improve it so that they're going out with the strongest gameplay they can. Absolutely. That, that is uh, definitely the purpose of doing norms. You want to you wanna have something to do that. Anna, what are your thoughts on uh, the This is a little bit of a different um, uh, exploration of neuroscience for you, but from what we've talked about, what is a, a really general opinion that you have on the topic? Yeah, so I'll say that um, I'm not in marketing or advertising, so um, it's, you know, it's good to be here. It's good to meet you all, but my perspective is sort of coming from a parallel world in a sense. So I study... Um, how companies market uh, measurement, neuroscience measurement technologies directly to consumers. So it may be some of the same tools that um, neuroscience that uh, neuroscience marketing researchers are using. So EEG headsets and things like that. Um, and so my perspective and and you know what I study is both sociology and ethics. And I do a lot of looking at the landscape of the marketing of direct to consumer uh, neurotech to the public. So you know how are companies um, selling uh, neuroscience measurements products directly to consumers? What claims are they making about um, those products? And then I think the relation to norms here is, you know, certain companies are maybe making claims, um, you know, by saying you'll do better than the norm, right? You'll be enhanced above what's typically normal when you 
get your EEG measurements or something like that. Not all right. companies make those claims, but but some do, right? So I think about norms in the sense of the of the kinds of claims that um, companies uh, are making about the measurements themselves. And I think that's a really interesting thing to come back to. Um, Ray, what is your experience with norms and metrics and in, in, in neuroscience? Well, um, quite extensive because I've been lucky enough to work uh, at so many different places, including the Advertising Research Foundation, where I got to meet Chuck and uh, actually was on a council that uh, Vino and the Temple folks presented on neuroscience, so pretty up to date on that. But um, yeah, I think just, just a few things. Uh, norms are not averages. Um, norms are rep have to be representative. They have to be constantly refreshed, which uh, I'm not sure necessarily ad agencies do on a regular basis. In other words, you have to include competitor ads as well as your ads to get a true norm. When I think of norms, it's the standardized test, the mm -hmm. SAT and things like that, which is a totally different ballgame than I, most, I would say most advertising folks deal with. Perhaps I'm wrong, maybe it's gotten better, but I saw so much of that comparison to averages, comparison to just the ads we have on, on hand. And you know, sometimes some of the ads were 10, 15 years old and they're still part of the quote normative database. So that's to me more of an issue than, than whether norms are good or bad. Uh, mm -hmm. it, to know really what a norm is scientifically and then to be able to reproduce that or, or at least you know, hold up to that standard. So, that's so it does seem like it's a bit of a moving target and that we have to be aware that norms should be a moving target. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, like you mentioned early on, the, the constant change. Norms should be updated continuously, so they should be able to start to take that into account as they're updated, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think companies do that. They probably do it once a year for cost efficiency, perhaps. I don't really know precisely, but I'm just going by what I've seen in terms of- Yeah, because every, every company kind of has their own norms, right? So everybody who provides this sort of research um, sort of provides their, their own norm, whatever it might mean. And it's kind of based on their own metric, um, which is like their special sauce of what they think adds into a good gauge of performance, right? Um, so when you talk about the SAT, for example, so whether it's the SAT or the ACT, it's supposed to be a general measure, but we know that most of these standardized tests tend to have some sort of bias, right? Um, that they may not be entirely reflective of the general population, or they may not be reflective of a true norm. Um, do we have any thoughts well, I, around that? Well, I think Ray is talking about freshness dating, <laughs> which is something we do at our company. Is like when we celebrate the bigger companies, usually they trot out the fact we have 40,000 ads in our database because that's a mm -hmm. nice moat mo to put around your business. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. Think, and not a researcher, that's, that's a barrier to entry for any new, new entrants and so on. But uh, you know, your job isn't to beat an ad that ran 10 years ago. Athletes right. get better year after year. Olympic records keep getting broken. That's that's why performance goes up. Your job is to beat the advertising that's running against you right now. In the ideal world, you would just test your advertising against every competitive ad, but that's kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you could do a test against every other ad, but no, no company is going to spend that amount of money. So, so a good norm that's validated to something you care about uh, you know, that's, uh, that's reliable and, and, uh, and, and precise and so on. That's, that's, uh, you know, that, that adds a lot of value to the predictive power of a pretest. It's not everything, you know, I've done experiments with, uh, with actually Dr. Steve Sands at the University of El Paso. He's, you know, he's a real expert on, on EEG machinery. You know, he actually builds the equipment that, you know, some people in the NIH use and so on. And, and we found that uh, in terms of predicting things like awareness in the marketplace, he could predict things with EEG and I could predict things with my memory test from the picture source, but we're zero correlation. Mm -hmm. You know, he's- he, What does that mean then? What that means is, and I'll give you, I'll give you an interpretation. It's a hypothesis that I've written about in my new book, Making Memories. When the brain gets aroused and you're measuring with an EEG machine, it basically says there's something new in the world. Let's pay attention to this. The model I have, the prediction I'm making about what's gonna happen isn't working. Let's figure out what that is. And so the EEG, the, the brain activates, increases energy, and the EEG is picking up on that. What I'm picking up on after the fact, after they've seen the stimulus, is once the brain has made sense of what that stimuli is and turned it into a memory that hopefully is being contributed to the brand formation process, I'm getting it at the other end after the brain has figured out what the meaning of that stimulus was and so on. 
So we're actually very complimentary in the sense of he's picking up the arousal and mm -hmm. I'm picking up the patient that's filed away in memory. No conflict yeah. of interest at all, but basically, you know, we're measuring two different things and we both have the power to predict what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. um, Vinod or Anna, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I'll just weigh into your question before, just thinking about normative databases, um, I guess, as the ethicist uh, <clears throat> on the panel, um, I think a lot about bias. And again, I'm not familiar with the norms used in, in our marketing research, right? But I think about other situations where normative databases are, are created, right? So who's, you know, some of the biggest questions are who's included in the formation of the database and, and more importantly, who's left out, right? And how do we think about those sorts of things? And so... Um, there was just a recent paper that was published um, by um, a researcher at Carnegie Mellon, I think several researchers showing that EEG measurements really don't um, pick up a very reliable signal um, from the scalps of people from uh, with Afri of African descent because their hair is coarser and curlier, right? So when I think about, you know, what's in this database and what's being compared to, right? I, I think there are questions about who's who's included and, and who's left out and how that database is constructed. Yeah, and that EEG problem with hair type um, also depends on length of hair to some degree too, because that can definitely have an interference that we've found. But I think another measure, you know, we're talking about EEG, but a very popular measure, especially right now as people are more remote has been um, facial coding. And a real problem with facial coding, coding is that it cannot measure people of other ethnicities very well at all. Um, you know, so there's definitely bias there as well. Um, Vino, did you have some thoughts on this as well? Yeah, sorry, jumped, jumped several levels. I'm trying to pick up on, uh, on yeah. which, thread, which thread to talk about. Um, I think going to the, going back uh, to the very first thread on, on norms, I think um, in neuroscience terms, uh, we usually refer to the need for reference, right? Um, because uh, changes are all relative to, to what else is going on. Uh, and, and some people use the norms as reference, but then the, the problem with norms uh, that we've already talked about uh, and using norms as a reference is they change. Um, when you have big events uh, or, or when new players come into the market that is a completely new product, uh, they may not be best represented within the database of norms that you have from others, other tests that you have done in the past and so on. Uh, so I always think that uh, the best thing to try and do, of course, cost is a factor, but but is to find what's the best reference for the kind of test that you're currently doing and see if you can include some of those ads, if, you, if you're doing it in the context of ads into your test. Um, so you have both, right? So you have currently when people are doing this, how are they performing for the new category with, ref with respect to some reference? And how did that reference fit in the past norms, right? So that way you get a new measure. If that measure doesn't seem to be consistent with what you had in the norms, it makes you question like, should you update your norms? But more importantly, all the inferences that you're making now are at least within the current participant um, and, and how they are responding to the new ad that you're testing with respect, with respect to something that you've already tested. Right, so I think that's important and, and extending that further to some neuro methods, um, you also want to be sure that you have some, some other third reference. Like if you want to argue that it's creating arousal, maybe you want some stimuli that generate arousal that are not mm -hmm. ads, that are just well-tested uh, databases or other things that are out there so that you have an independent way of saying that, look, this ad is performing better than this reference with respect to this particular metric. And I also show that in things that show high arousal, the same metric is doing better and so we have a better way of arguing that maybe these ads are indeed causing higher arousal. Um, so that way it avoids this thing that we are just relying too much on a metric and this metric is supposed to do X, Y, Z, but, mm -hmm. but every time we are running these, we are getting, and it's not a lot of data. Like you can just, like if you're doing a, somebody's EEG study, you probably need to throw in another two minutes worth of data where you're, you're throwing some well-known well, well known stimuli and seeing whether they generate the same kind of process that you're interested yeah, in. like a range, and, and right? And you can pick up on that, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's because basically what I would- what does it mean if it's arousal? Like, is it a good arousal or a bad arousal? And Chuck, let me build, if you wanna say something. Back to norms. <laughs> let me bring it back to a point Anna was making, differences by audience segments. You know, our, our big clients, we only work with big clients frequently do segment analysis because you'll get very different reactions from different audience segments. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're testing among Hispanics, they use rating scales very differently than, you know, than, uh, than uh, the rest of the population. Blacks actually don't. Uh, but if you look at Asian respondents, for example, if you tried to compare 
U.S. responses on a standardized test the way Ray's talking about it and try to compare it to China or Japan or Germany is like, good luck, you know, because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're mixing, comparing apples to oranges. You have to normalize the data if you're going to be comparing things across country. So that is a very good, important issue. You've got to be able to look within a segment. You know, that's going to speak to the issue of the, uh, not the validity, but the reliability of your measurements. Because, because, you know, if I do a retest of an ad and I don't get the same result, the very first thing I do is go back and look at what was the sample composition. We yeah. operate in 40 countries and, 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 and the big suppliers are pretesting basically have procedures for making this adjustment. Millward Brown, for example, or the link system, you know, would not, you would not compare across countries without doing a normalized comparison. And I, now there I is a lot it, of uh, misunderstanding, I think, out there when it mm -hmm. comes, when it comes to um, the, the neuroscience aspects of it. I think some people mm -hmm. think that because it's a fancy tool that measures the brain, that it somehow can bypass some of these issues. There's certainly been people selling these tools that will say that you can avoid bias, um, that you can get people's true response, um, but you can still have cultural differences when you're measuring people's, you know, quote unquote, implicit reactions, right? I'm going to toss that maybe to the even, node or Anna. Even the old dial meters, I'm old enough to go back to Leo Burnett in the, at the tail end of the Mad Men days. Mm -hmm. When we were dial meters back in the 80s, we found out you had, you, you basically had to calibrate the dial meter, the response time of the respondent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Before you go in and make any kind of generalizations about what you were learning. And people using dial meters don't do that anymore. They basically mm -hmm. just, they look at that beautiful curve that's going up and down. Because so there can be individual differences, whether it is something in a dial yeah. or um, a survey or, but also neuroscience measures, right? So can we talk a little bit about the individual differences people can have? physiologically, maybe. I don't know, left brain, right brain, anybody? <laughs> no, I, I think it goes back. I, th I think that's why that, that, that's kind of the, the point. I mean, the second, it's kind of related to my earlier point, um, which is that uh, most of the neuroscience methods, it's important to have your relative baselines or relative comparisons, right? Because it's within subject, right? Within subject, yeah. So that's why I think it's rather than saying, like I just try to compare how a person is responding just to one particular ad and then comparing it to a norm of something else, even if it is the same demographic, somebody else who's done similar kinds of mm -hmm. study before and say like that one gave me a seven and this one gives me a nine. So now this ad is better. That's problematic because we know that there are individual differences in how people, how people react and the degree of activation and so on. And that's why it becomes important to have in, within subject baselines, like are they just looking at a, a simple picture over time uh, or are they looking at other things that have that have like reasonable expectation and you're looking at what is the change relative to uh, something that does not have arousal and something that has arousal and look at that change or the person change in, in the values and then you compare that for different stimuli, for example, add A and add B, which one had a greater person change. That way, what you're doing is you're correcting for some of these individual differences, even not, not just responses to the ad, but at the physiology level, if there are any individual differences, you're correcting for those. And then you're, you're just looking at that relative change um, across different ads or across different copies of ads and how does that well, compare kind of a thing. There, there's actually a, a second issue because my whole especially is self-report memory data. It's, I don't work with any gadgets. We just collect the data online and cell phones, okay? But we collect what people remember from the experience. And Danny Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, makes the really important point, you know, that, you know, that it's the remembered self that makes all economic decisions, not the experience itself. That's the unknown world that you guys are exploring and so on. Now, when an experience of an ad is translated into a branded memory, memory distorts the experience because it focuses on peaks and endings, correct? One of the problems you have with using things like facial response or any of these moment by moment gadget driven things is that a lot of people are looking at the first pass. In other words, you're reading the response of the brain to an advertising experience before they know what the ending is. And you don't know the meaning of the ad until you've seen the end of the story, right? One of the things I found out recently that actually uh, Kantar in terms of working with the, uh, 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 the, uh, the facial response stuff that they are doing right is they figured out that the first pass through on reading an ad is not predictive. They have to actually look at the second pass through in the facial response data because by that point, the consumer knows the ending of the story and memory knows what to file away in terms of the meaning of the ad. 
So when you guys are doing stuff with EEG or fMRI and so on, are you looking at the first time they've seen the ad moment by moment before they know how the story turns out? Mm -hmm. Or are you looking at it at, so, after the second time? So Those I think that people, for the most part, that, I don't think people go back and, and measure again. Uh, um, I, I don't think that they typically do that when you look at the majority of neuromarketing companies. I do think that they just look at the first pass. There are other ways of doing these studies where you uh, might want to be uh, looking at multiple exposures. Um, but Vinod, in your experience in doing quite a bit of this type of testing, what, what do you do? What's the typical design of the study? Yeah, so it, it varies. And again, it comes down to, I, I think the, the answer is not that simple because it comes down to what do we think is the factor that's driving uh, the market level phenomenon, right? Uh, I, I'll draw a parallel now from, from something that's slightly different, which is more an fMRI, but this this whole field um, that's trying to work towards what's called neuroforecasting. And basically mm -hmm. the idea there is uh, you have brain responses to a small group of people. So usually about 30 to 35 people that are being exposed to stimuli uh, in most of these studies just once. And the stimuli can be wide ranging. It can be an ad, it can be um, a crowdfunding request. Uh, it can be YouTube pre-rolls. Uh, so it's been done in a variety of different areas. And of course, movie trailers is another popular one that it's been done in. Um, and you get brain responses uh, across a set of 30 to 40 people when they are watching these stimuli once. Um, and then you get aggregate responses across this group on how they responded to each of these stimuli. And you relate it to some real world performance. So in our case mm -hmm. with ARF, we did it with, uh, with market elasticities for ads. Um, in the case of YouTubes, they do it with how often do people watch the entire pre-roll or do they just skip it? Uh, in the case of crowdfunding, they went back to the companies that were running these campaigns to find out which campaigns were successful and which were not. And they tried to use the brain responses to predict um, how successful the stimuli was going to be in the marketplace. And the really early one was done with music albums and they tested this with how successful the music album was at a later point of time. Now, with a lot of this stimuli, what, what, what we find consistently is that activation in this region called the nucleus accumbens predicts what happens at the market level, but another region, which is a ventromedial prefrontal cortex, predicts a lot more with what happens within that particular sample. Now, this is interesting and goes back to a lot of discussions here because one view of thinking about this is um, when we are trying to process stimuli, uh, there are two aspects to it. One is our, our immediate, like, do I like this? The first response kind of a thing. And the second one is the idiosyncrasies on would I engage with this? Uh, for example, if you're watching an ad, you, you, you probably are like, but I already have that product or I've used that product so many times that I'm probably not going to purchase it. So if you ask somebody, how likely are you to purchase this product? You may say zero, but that doesn't mean that you didn't like the product or you didn't think it was going to be successful. You said zero because you already have it and you're not going to buy it again, right? And so that distinction is what these two regions make. The, the nucleus accumbens is the raw response that is like forgetting about all the constraints that you have and all the other factors that you bring into it when you're trying to evaluate a particular product or an ad. But, but the ventral media prefrontal cortex is the one that's the integrator that decides like, how much did you like it? How relevant it is for you? Do you really need it now? Uh, are, you, are you looking to purchase it? And those kinds of things. And that's why when you look at what happens at the market level, the, the most common predictor is the first response, which is like before people bring the idiosyncrasies to it, like how do they all react to it? The things that generate that strong first response are probably likely to be more successful uh, than ones that don't. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody who's seeing this ad is going to go purchase it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the ventral medial prefrontal cortex comes into play. I have kind of a question in that. Um, so when we're looking at these performance metrics, right? So whether it's a change that we're tracking in a particular brain area, or if it's from a scale question, like how likely are you to purchase, um, or if it's, you know, something like how aroused or excited were you, how memorable was this ad? Um, when you do, are looking at a performance metric, um, that could certainly change over time, right? So where something that is quite funny, right, it's comedic, um, might be quite successful as an ad, but that doesn't mean that being funny is always going to work, right? Yeah. So I think that's maybe the same with neuro, but also with any other metric that you might be using that does it is it really generalizable entirely that well, it has to get this above this thing i only read newspapers one time to get the news 
and then I listen to the Beatles records that I've heard a thousand times, depending <laughs> on why you're engaging with the stimulus. You know, mm -hmm. if I want the emotional experience, I can hear it over and over again. I, you know, jokes, once you know the punchline, you know the ending of the joke, they tend to be less funny. But, you know, music, nonverbal things, like I'll watch old movies over and over again. I'm not doing it for rational information. I'm doing it for the emotional experience. So then your suggestion is to be successful, it needs to be emotional. Anna, it looks like you wanted to add something there or no? Okay. Um, do you think it has to be emotional or can informational ads actually it, be just as effective? There's a, there's a life stage distinction to be made here. Because there's two things that you're doing with advertising when you're building a brand. Number one, you're positioning the brand in the semantic me memory system. If you're a new product, that's the main job of introductory advertising, to show the consumer how this brand fits into the world and why it fits. You're, you're yeah, implanting it in the category-driven thinking brain, okay? Uh, once you stop being a new product and start being an established brand, you're trying to build a relationship with the consumer. And you're not going to be building the relationship by repeating your positioning over and over again. You're going to be doing it by sharing creating shared experiences with the consumer, using music, using dance, using design, using mm -hmm. all the story arts, telling great stories and so on. And, and that's a common mistake that creatives make. They always want to go into making year two advertising before they do year one advertising, but they're working, you know, but there are three memory systems in the brain, the semantic, the episodic, and the procedural. Emotions are only stored in the episodic and the procedural memory system. The semantic memory system is where the positioning is stored, but brand imagery which is our emotional relationship with the brand is stored in the other two and not understanding which part of the memory system you're targeting with your advertising can lead to you know, disasters in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, right? that's, a, that's a tough thing to really tease apart in how typically people do their research. Let's hear a little bit from Ray. We haven't heard much from Ray on, on this topic. Think, Ray? I'll take it away. Um, no, actually what, it, what this discussion is, is uh, reinforcing is really my thought since I've been involved in this wacky world of advertising, it's uh, so multi-dimensional, has so many perspectives and sides. What I've done in my applied work uh, with Paul Bowles from, now, well, now he's at Washington State, and uh, Joel Weinberger, is I've combined methods. And yes, sometimes the methods don't correlate at all, but they give you a different view, a different perspective into what's going on. Let me, let me give you an example. We, we did a study uh, of a uh, Target uh, retail store's placement in, uh, it was a product placement or exposure in, in Ellen's show. This is before all the nonsense happened. And um, you know the self-report data told everyone loves Ellen. So that came through really clear. The implicit association test, however, under, under uh, 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 what do you call it? Brought up a, 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 a lot of resentment the prize, she was giving a prize, a Target gift card to this uh, uh, woman who was unemployed and had a family, single mom, very sad story. So in the self-report, everyone was so sympathetic and empathetic. In the implicit, there was a lot of resentment, like why should, why should she get that? I should get the Target card, not her. So it was interesting to see the dynamics and how you really have to think these things. And through. I think that's an interesting point about diagnostic versus hey, norm comparison. So I think a lot of the um, way that neuroscience and psychology is really used is usually in diagnostics, which is a little more around that sort of question. I do want to get to a question that one of the uh, attendees has, which is there are many com companies offering neuroconsumer research using single electrode EEG headsets. Are they reliable? What are the pros and cons? Um, could I get uh, some some expert uh, thoughts on single electric EEG? Anna? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, yeah, we have a note on the line who's the neuroscientist. So, so I'll just, I'll throw it to him in a minute, but I'll just say that um, a colleague and I wrote a paper um, analyzing um, the consumer headsets that are in the market. So not actually measuring their reliability itself, but just looking at what sorts of um, studies, if any, had been put out that would establish their validity and reliability. And, and we found that um, there wasn't a whole lot there establishing reliability and validity of, of these um, consumer headsets. And I think personally, I would have a lot of concerns about a, a single electrode headset. Um, I think I have an idea of the one that um, is being referred to there. Um, 
but you know, with a single electrode headset, there's one that um, goes on the forehead, right? And so there's a lot of artifacts that can come into uh, be picked up, right? So from the face, um, like facial uh, muscle movement, right, can create a lot of artifacts. And blinking is one of the biggest ones, right? Blinking, yeah. And so, um, you know, what is the software that's being used to remove mm. those artifacts, right? And what's the signal that's actually coming through? And so I think that gets to a tension between. Right. So, so as an academic scientist or researcher, right, I, I, I look to see whether there's any public uh, publications about um, reliability and validity, right? But companies, of course, have an interest in keeping this proprietary, right? So it doesn't mean, right. I can't say it doesn't exist, right? But, but um, from the outside, I have questions. But, but still, there's this tension, right? Like, as, as somebody who would be paying a neuromarketing researcher, I'd, I'd want to know that information before I... Uh, you know, paid for those services. But again, well, I'm not a, neuro a neuroscientist. So. <laughs> the, the one Professor Sands, he does 72 nodes. His data looks like it came out of an FRI machine because you can look at the different parts of the brain's lighting up. Frankly, his attitude would be that a one node, FRI, a one node EEG machine would be a toy. It's not a scientist. Well, it, so here's the so, thing about EEG, and I think the node would probably agree with me on this. So I, I'll just interject because I think that's somewhere in between which is that EEG is just ele measuring electrical activity across the scalp. Right. So whether you use one or a billion, you're still measuring electrical activity. So it's absolutely doing that with one. The problem is, is that you do have this noise, right? So if you have more electrodes, then you can start to filter out a little bit better and you have more reliability, right? The notes, um, which you can definitely speak to this, but I think that one issue I want to bring up here before we let Vinod go into more of the specifics about the, the validity of it and the reliability is that the majority, you know, to, to Anna's point, the majority of consumer grade EEG headsets are eight or fewer electrodes. And um, you do not have to have a special license, degree, qualification, or anything to hang up a sign and say, I'm a neuromarketer and I'm going to measure your brain. So anybody can buy one of these on Amazon and get it delivered to you this afternoon um, and start measuring people and saying, making all sorts of claims, um, which is not the same as the sort of academic grade that I'm sure Vinod is using. Um, Vinod, can you speak a bit to that? Yeah, so, I mean, there are multiple levels and I try, I try to find a balance when I'm answering this question. Like if I'm an academic, I mean, obviously I wouldn't use anything less than 64. Uh, most cases we use 128 and even go up to 256. Now you have to understand what this does, right? So what you have is a cap that has like multiple points. Um, and so the more the electrodes, the more the signal you're, you're getting from the entire uh, distribution of the scalp. Now, this is important for two reasons. Um, the most important one is that um, the more the electrodes that you have, the better it helps you localize. Uh, so when, when with some of the measures, the common measures, for example, the frontal alpha asymmetry, uh, which is one of the most common use measures with EEG, um, which is trying to find this relation between approach versus avoidance behavior based on the activation of the central electrodes. Uh, that is not using all the 256 electrodes. Uh, it is only using primarily two, but depending on how good uh, density you have, you can probably say like a set of electrodes on the left and set of electrodes on the right, and it's calculating a relative measure based on those values. Uh, so if somebody has their entire algorithm that is based on just this measure, and they have done some kind of validation to show that this measure reliably um, distinguishes between something that's successful and not, or something that leads to approach behavior versus not, then they don't need 256 electrodes to cap capture this, right? So I think the way to, to answer this question is, I mean, one seems too little because obviously then the question becomes like, how are they correcting for confounds and stuff like that? Um, but when you're talking about somebody who has eight electrodes, the question that I would ask them is, more about what is the basis of their measure, what is it that they are trying to explain with it, and whether or not that, that particular measure can be addressed with the fact that you just have eight electrodes over there, right? So I don't think that we should expect every neuromarketing company to do 256 electrodes or even 64 right. electrodes for that matter, but mm -hmm. I think we need to uh, push 
to ask them, even if they can't share the proprietary algorithms and so on, uh, at least the basis of their measure, what is it that they are trying to capture at a broad level? Is it really about capturing the, um, the, the emotion? Is it really about capturing the memory effectiveness? Is it really about capturing attention? Like what is it that they are trying to capture and then ask whether or not that particular measure can be captured reliably with the number of electrodes that they have. But that special sauce, that metric, it's both in the marketing research on the survey questions people ask for their normative database for performance, right? But it's also used a lot in neuromarketing where we don't know that special sauce and they often don't want to tell you, you know, they're telling you it's a score of eight or they're telling you that, you know, you scored, you know, 80 out of 100. Um, would, and it can be very difficult for the consumer, you know, whether they are, you know, the average consumer buying something off of Amazon or, you know, the market research consumer working for a large company. Um, it's difficult for them to determine if something is truly valid. How, how would you address this issue? And anyone can maybe step in here. I want to, want, to, want to just talk a little bit about a validation study and answer your question first we, that I did with Steve, because I'm not a neuroscientist, but he uses a 64 node at the time he was using the 64 node reader venom. We did a study that we presented at the ARF a few years ago where back in, in about 10 years ago, I was running a syndicated service where I was testing every ad that came on the fast food category within 24 hours. And uh, you know, so I had a huge database of, uh, of self-reported pre-testing data. And I went back nine years later to find out what memories are still left behind by all those fast food commercials that were running at the time. So I had 2,000 commercials. I grabbed 5,000 images from them and interviewed 5,000 people. And Steve went and measured a bunch of those people with his, uh, with his brainwave equipment. And both what we measure, obviously, with the self-report data and what he was measuring with his EEG equipment is that we could predict at a, you know, at a, at a, you know, a, a high level of discrimination the difference between images that stuck in people's minds for nine years after they saw the ad building brand equity versus the ones that, you know, that had vanished from maybe at that point in time. So, and that was a good case where, you know, where, where the EEG and the uh, self-report data was working together. Now EEG, equipment, I can't use that. I can't, it doesn't operate at scale for me. Okay. Which is why I, I play with this stuff, but I do anything with it. But back to a point Ray was making earlier, it's like he was apologizing for the fact that he had variables that were uncorrelated. Where if you're building a model, that's what you want. You want independent variables. And so basically saying I have some information coming from, from the EEG or neuroscience side and some other information coming from the, the self-report side, it's not a problem that they're uncorrelated. It's mm -hmm. an asset. You put that's, the two together, yeah. better yeah. that's certainly model. how it should be looked at is that they, they don't necessarily need you to replicate, right? So that is a good no. question. You know, what does validation mean? But for, for neuro into this sort of stuff. Um, but I, I think that uh, let's, let's get to some, some other issues as we come to the close of the hour. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that I want to get to from the audience as well. And again, if any of you have questions, feel free to enter them into either the chat or the Q and A section. Um, one question is asking, okay, how do you integrate neuro data in with survey data? And does that maybe affect what, you know, say your metric is for your survey data for your norms? Can you add that in when you have potentially two totally different populations uh, where you're measuring 30 to 40 people with the neuro data um, and potentially thousands um, or tens of thousands with your, your normative database? Uh, is, is that something that, that you see often or that you would do, Ray, it seems like you might have some input in this. Yeah, well, the, the trick is to, the, to use the folks that did the neuro to also do the survey, pre post or post hoc or whatever like that. So it's a sample, but at least you get uh, some reference connection point. And that's exactly what we did in, in all the studies I've done, so that um, there is that um, connection, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I do see another question here specifically for Anna, kind of around a similar issue um, about these more consumer grade, right? Um, have you really looked at, done yourself, looked at studies or studied yourself the merit of these consumer grade EEGs, maybe from a wearable type perspective? Will consumers use wearable EEGs in the future? And is this something that maybe even marketers might want to use to gauge people's interaction with products around them or communications around them? What do you see that sort of future? So it's a very uh, good question. So I haven't studied these specifically, 
But um, it is interesting. And I think the question points to a broader trend that consumers are going to have access to more and more information um, about their own biometrics, right? So um, the Apple Watch is one example, right? Um, so from the for consumer EEG, I think there's companies struggling to figure out what value um, this data can add to consumers. And, and I think from what we've seen, it doesn't really add a whole lot of value at the moment, um, personally to consumers, I think. Like from a health perspective. From a health perspective. I mean, they do make claims regarding improving meditation, you know, having access to your EEG data. EEG data can help you improve sleep and things like that. Um, but again, the studies and the scientific evidence are really just not there. And again, especially when we're talking about these consumer grade devices, right? So even if they're research studies pointing to some of these things, it's not clear that those always trend. It could be a leap. Mm -hmm. I think there is a leap to the consumer grade devices, but I'll, I'll just say one thing to look out for in the future, right? Is that we have a lot of investment right now um, in um, more mobile um, tools, uh, Silicon Valley investment in, in more mobile brain recording tools. Um, and I think a lot of these are going to be sold to consumers. And I think the question there is gonna be how are companies going to be marketing this data? And, and I don't see a good mm. case for it yet, but it'll be interesting to see. That's a really interesting thing to bring up is the, the privacy of this sort of data. I know there are certain countries, for example, I believe France and Europe, that was very concerned about the privacy when it comes to measuring brain, uh, measuring the brain um, and sort of being invasive into people's um, thinking, right? So we know, and I think we can all agree that none of these devices read the mind. We cannot read people's minds, but there is concern over privacy issues and maybe um, trying to communicate with people in a subliminal way, kind of getting back to the days of subliminal advertising and what's the ethical issues around that. But when it comes to using uh, neuroscience to you know, better market to people, what are the ethics in that? Uh, what are your thoughts around privacy? I think Google Glasses is a good case in point. <laughs> mm, how's that? It was the issue that was the problem with getting them adapted, not technical issues, the mm -hmm. ethical issues. Yeah. Even in though your thoughts are, sorry, Anna, go ahead. Chuck, do you mean in terms of um, that it people would be like people? Somebody coming into the room with glasses, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, that everything they're seeing, people have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so know? technically we can do it, Glasses, but ethically. Kind of cool, but it's like socially mm -hmm. unacceptable. Right, but you might be recording people without them realizing it. But in these cases where the, it could be the same as someone agreeing to answer a survey, if they agree to have their brain waves measured, um, you know, is it yeah. ethical to use that information to influence that purchasing issue. behavior? And, but you're setting up a panel then and you've got issues of panel representation, that's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's ways around it, I'm sure, that we, you know, bright young people like you are going to solve these problems in the future, but they're not <laughs> easy. <problems. laughs> I, I mean, so I, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how it's going to be used to influence people's purchases or, or what that quite means at the moment. Um, but, but there is a lot of conversation right now about, and, and I'm sure everybody on this panel knows more about this than I do, because it's not my area, right? But like the ethics of nudging, right? And other mm -hmm. ways that you can exactly. influence decision-making, right? So, so Which has the, always been around right with or without neuroscience right mm -hmm. you know you could have an image that influences people right there's there's so many ways that you could influence people's decision making so mm -hmm. um, i guess i'm not sure exactly what you know how neuroscience will be used to influence decision making but then however that would be i'd compare it to the scale of what of what currently but i think it's important to note that there is no special buy button in the brain so even with you know finding that you know people are reacting to a certain color because you saw a reaction in, in EEG patterns doesn't mean that by showing that color you're going to be forcing people to do something um, and that's where that difference between nudging and I don't know coercion I'm not really sure what the the appropriate word is there but I, I don't believe that it, it's that much of an issue Vinod would you agree with that yeah I agree I don't I think we are we are still very far away from the days of saying that I, I'm just because I understand how your brain is responding to a stimulus that I'm presenting. Uh, I understand exactly how you make decisions and I can just manipulate them. I think most of the neuroscience-based findings today are still at a broad aggregate level on, um, on how can we use information from a group of people to understand like what helps them to make decisions. Um, and so the, the only thing that neuroscience is trying to do is then saying, 
like if we understand better how people are making these decisions, how do we change the way we are presenting information and stuff like that, that gets into the the nudge and choice architecture and those kinds of things. But mm -hmm. I don't think these concerns are at the individual level that I'm reading the brains and I'm doing something to the individual, but it's more that we are getting better at understanding how people make decisions, um, mm -hmm. which obviously can lead to better ways of um, helping them make better decisions or manipulate it to help them uh, or, or lead them the path of a bad decision. And that's where the ethics comes well, into play. In a discussion that's not held enough because the focus is on engagement with advertising, where frankly, as a business person, what I'm interested in is building a brand. And that's mm -hmm. the thing going debate between the behaviorism of current tech companies versus building brands and so on. Right. Uh, 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 Tech company believes in subscription models like Netflix, right? That's how they make their money, most a lot of them. And uh, Procter & Gamble believes in brands. Brands are the subscription model for package goods companies, basically. They want a long predictive, long predictive revenue stream and so on. And that's a function of the loyalties that you build up over time with multiple ads across multiple channels in terms of building this molecule, giant molecule in the mall that's called this the brand associations that are operating in the sure. memory networks of the and nobody's really talked about that. I've had this field of myself for 30 years, studying how memory operates and how the brand formation process operates. And everybody else is over here talking about ads. It's like, if the ad mm -hmm. doesn't sell it, you know, mm -hmm. I'm wasting my time. Well, we'll talk yeah. if it makes you feel any better. We yeah. talk about it all the time, brand. actually. So, uh, how the ad builds a brand in the mind. Yeah. That's what I want. At ACD, we actually talk about it quite a bit, uh, you know, trying to put that focus on those sort of learned associations that people do end up gaining through memory. And I do think that that's very important uh, when it comes to branding. Now, you know, we've come up on the hour and so I want to make sure to sort of wrap it up. We didn't get to all our questions. And so it might actually be really interesting to do another discussion again sometime if everybody's interested in it because I think there's still a lot to talk about here. Um, you know, if you're interested, uh, but also everybody can feel free to reach out to us individually if you um, have further questions and we can always direct it to some of the panelists uh, if you have further questions for them. But I would like to just get a little bit on everybody's thoughts individually about the future of this, whether it is about norms and metrics or the use of neuroscience, what do you see uh, as the future of um, you know, this sort of research where we're understanding more about human behavior uh, and using all the tools possible? Um, so around this topic, Ray, uh, since I know you didn't get as much chance as we could say with some others, uh, if you want to kick off your um, predictions for, for what's going to happen with the future of this. No predictions, I'll pass. <laughs> well, that keeps it pretty simple. Um, but no, your thoughts on um, predictions about how maybe norms are going to be used or metrics that are going to add in yeah, our think... clients? Yeah, so I, I think, or I don't mean, know whether it's a prediction or a wish, uh, but I, I just, I think like uh, soon we will get to a stage where we will get better at integrating some of these methods, not talking about them as something that's completely out of access or, or something um, with too much awe, but, but it's just a part of a toolbox that you more naturally and seamlessly decide like for this particular study, um, just like you would have done a focus group and a survey or whatever it is in the, in the past market research techniques, you just have these additional tools that are available that you're like, um, for this one, I'm just going to collect some uh, facial expressions and code them in, or, or for this one, I may just want to measure arousal. And then, so I'm going to try and do that kind of a thing. Um, so it's not like every single thing needs all the methods, but just based on what question it is and which stage of the development process you are in, you would be able to draw on these tools in an appropriate manner to get better insights. That's, that's what I hope will happen in the future. Absolutely makes sense. Uh, Chuck, briefly, uh, what do you see in the future? Well, the uh, two most successful uh, scalable and widely used uh, neuroscience methods would be uh, facial response and eye tracking, and they're not going away. Uh, a method that I haven't played with enough that I think could improve my, my, uh, my memory test, the self-report stuff, after you've seen an ad would be response time. Mm -hmm. I just never bothered and I think what I think would make my system more accurate. I haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, I think the, the issue is actually a fairly big one because we're not really just talking about advertising or brands, we're talking about our culture and the belief systems that yeah. currently divide and so on. In other, in other times and other places, we would talk about advertising as propaganda. So if we want to understand, you know, how citizens are going to operate in our culture and so on, understanding how the communications that are coming from social media, that are coming from television and other sources and so on, that's a big problem. I worry about that for my grandkids. I don't mm -hmm. worry about advertising. 
<laughs> I know how yeah. enough about how it's certainly it changing the game, and I think it's going to affect. But what I don't know is like, what is all this stuff doing to the culture? What is this going to be doing for the future mm -hmm. that we create? That is the big question. It certainly should change the way we measure things and how we look at how the uh, different, um, you know, sharing happens now. It's quite different. And I would like to get your last thoughts on maybe this topic is new for you. And so I think um, maybe your perspective, again, from a, a future standpoint, an ethical standpoint uh, of all, all of this. Yeah, I'll say two things. So one is that um, I think we're going to have more tools to measure the brain um, that are going to be more accessible, um, probably to people in your fields um, in the coming years. I mean, there's certainly a lot of investment in that space. So yeah. Um, so I think that there's gonna be new measurements. And so those are gonna afford opportunities, but also maybe replicate some of the problems um, and challenges um, that we currently have. Um, I just wanna, you know, the, the conversation on brain data, um, you know, like we could spend hours talking about that, right? But there is, it is very interesting, right? Um, how brain data should be protected and how it should be classified. So there is a move by some people um, to claim that it should be HIPAA protected, um, mm -hmm. that it should be a kind of uh, protected health information. I don't necessarily agree with that, but there's certainly a move mm -hmm. in that direction. Um, should it be classified like other health data or should it be just like any other consumer data? So Interesting uh, question. With the future of that, I think uh, also remains an opening question and it, it's something to kind of pay attention to. Wonderful. Well, I hope everybody has enjoyed uh, this discussion. And if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can always pass along questions to members of the panel. I want to thank everybody for participating. I think this is a really great discussion. A lot of more topics that we didn't even get to get to. Um, so perhaps we can do more in the future. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Panelists, have a wonderful day, wonderful weekend. And we'll talk to you all again soon. So thank you so nice. much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, everybody.